Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of the Search Podcast. Uh, so, uh, the next couple of episodes are, are based on some work I did with um, a group called Search Kuwait. It's an initiative by uh, the American College of Surgeons Kuwait chapter in association with uh, the Kuwait Association of Surgeons. Uh, it's a resident driven thing, which I think is pretty awesome. Um, they have sessions twice a week. And these are like really live sessions. They're off the cuff, on the fly, and people are texting stuff in. And it's always great stuff. Um, You know, it it really is. Uh, Interesting discussions all the time. And best of all, that you get a free uh, CME certificate at the end of it. Uh, To subscribe to their service, uh, just go on to uh, at Surge Kuwait on Instagram. Um, They're not directly related to the Surge podcast. Uh, but I'd like to think uh, that uh, it's a distant cousin and that we kind of work together. I've mentioned to them that they should put their stuff up on YouTube and maybe include some of the discussions because of how dynamic they are. Um, you know, whereas this is more of a soapbox format for the time being, I am getting some guests in. I'm going to start interviewing some of our chiefs about what they've been doing recently and things like that. Uh, but I think that these guys are off to an awesome start and I'd recommend that uh, other people join in. So uh, today's talk is one uh, that I gave uh, over there and is loosely based upon it with some modifications and it's about airway trauma. Now I previously talked about uh, surgical airways and talked about uh, difficult airways. Uh, But I think that there are certain nuances. I personally think that you can actually do a fellowship just on difficult airway situations. And it wouldn't be the wrong thing to do. I think that every hospital should have a minimum one or two people that are just extremely comfortable with a difficult airway. And the reason why is because it's the second most common cause of death from from a you know from a neck trauma, uh, blunt or penetrating. Uh, the most common being exsanguination, uh, as has been previously studied. In terms of a uh, quick disclaimer, so everybody whose picture is up here, and for the next three uh, series, in fact, I would say. of what I put up, unless there's something under it, uh, are patients that have been gracious enough to allow us to use their pictures uh, for educational purposes. They're under a Creative Commons license. Uh, The scope of today's talk is to effectively address the difficult airway and trauma. And, you know, that's all we're going to be talking about for this episode. I'm hoping to follow it up with the next episode on blunt cerebrovascular injuries and uh, my personal approach to them. And then maybe a third episode on damage control neck surgery in the context of penetrating neck injury, not blunt. So a quick case uh, from our practice. Uh, Over here in Kuwait, we have a a very good relationship with the local combat sports circuit. And this is one of the fights uh, that uh, we were covering as medical personnel. Um, I've said this before. I personally am involved with jujitsu. That's not how I would personally do a single leg takedown. But uh, or attempt it more aptly, but you know, needless to say, that happened. Now, afterwards, uh, the uh, person in the green shorts, his uh, GCS was 15 over 15. He didn't have any problems in terms of C spine protection, no focal neurological deficit. He was breathing, his blood pressure was fine, a little bit hypertensive, tachycardic for obvious reasons. He was perfect as a peach, except for one thing. When he looked in his mouth, there was a freely mobile mandible, and you can see that he broke his jaw with an open fracture on the inside. Now, as with most traumas, uh, you'd start off with your airway, address his uh, breathing, and make a decision. In this particular case, we did decide to take him for a CT brain C-spine, an awake intubation in the ER, an awake intubation in the OR, or surgical airway, bearing in mind that he's satting 99% and is awake and oriented. Well... You know, this brings up the dilemma, and the dilemma comes from a failure to recognize the difference between karate and MMA, or the matrix. And I mentioned this before during my difficult airway talk, where I compare dealing with an airway with preparing fresh pasta. Um, It's it's a long story. But uh, I would put it to you this way. With an elective airway, it's a preset set of rules. Uh, much like in karate, with a preset set of moves, and it's about coordination and timing, and there's a referee involved. 
with a resuscitation room airway that's potentially difficult, the airway is Neo from the Matrix. And uh, you are uh, the other person who keeps duplicating himself and can never win. Effectively, the airway is 100% adamant that it's going to win. It already knows your moves and it's already planned for them. And I would contend that uh, an airway expert isn't somebody who, and I've said this before, but I'll say it again, it's not somebody who's done 100,000 of these. It's somebody who knows what the first plan of attack is, has a backup plan, sets these things into motion early, and always has a failsafe. I don't think that it has anything to do with a fucking logbook. All right. I don't care how many gallbladders you've intubated. If somebody arrests because you can get their airway in time, you will be kicking your own ass for about a year because it's the most horrible feeling that I've ever seen anybody experience. Losing an airway is like one of the worst things that you can experience during your medical career. And I think that any of you who've been in that position can agree. And you have to understand, you will be faced with a difficult airway. It's an inevitability. But how you address it makes a huge difference to you, to your peers, to the stress levels in the room. And don't expect to know about it. So Danish anesthesia database, real data, right? Thousands of patients, 2008 to 2011, elective and otherwise. We cannot predict an airway. 58% of the time we couldn't predict the airway, the difficult airway. 58% of the time. 94% of the time, difficult bag mask ventilations were unanticipated. Most of the time, what saved them was having a backup plan. The backup plan was video laryngoscopy, but guess what? They hadn't checked the equipment earlier. These are attending level anesthetists. These aren't average anesthetists. You can make the argument, maybe yes, maybe no. There are default settings on the app that they use. You can make a hundred different arguments. But even if it's only true 10% of the time, it's still one in 10. And it's still one in 10 too much for us to say that the strategy is to learn the simple, the simplified airway risk index. Good luck applying that in the trauma bay. You're just not going to. So I would contend that to be an airway expert, the first thing that you need to know is how to set yourself up to win. How to have a plan, a backup plan, and a third level plan. Now RSI is by far the most studied in trauma situations and the most successful. But RSI requires preparation. You have to have your bag mask ready, you have to have everything else ready. If you're looking for details, uh, please watch my episode on the difficult airway, but you have to have high flow oxygen ready, your pre-medications ready, your actual medications ready, although it is RSI, I agree with you, but things like antibiotics, tetanus, etc. should be rolling already. You have to have your uh, secondary adjunct device, your backup person, and your post-intubation drugs available, as well as your CO2 capnography in place. RSI works in known anatomy. RSI does not work in clearly difficult or questionable anatomy. And so then your dilemma becomes, do I go to the operating room where there are most re more resources? Or do I deal with the airway in the emergency room because it's time sensitive? And what's the evidence for it? So if you look at the evidence, by and large, it's consensus statements. And whenever you open an anesthesia book, it's too complicated. I can't have this up in the trauma bay. I got R1s and R2s down there. There's no way they're going to learn all of this off by heart, right? Something that looks like this a little bit more realistic, which is why we use this a lot where I work. So the Difficult Airway Society has come up with a very simple way to deal with an unanticipated difficult airway. Laryngoscopy, try. You don't get it, put an LMA in. Put the LMA in, temporize yourself, take a deep breath, and figure it out. And here's how I figure it out. So this is my completely uh, sort of anecdotal experience-based uh, discussions with anesthetists, buying them coffee, uh, discussions with emerge room guys that do intubations regularly, ENT guys as well. This is my sort of take on things. So I start making a decision to intubate. Am I intubating because of normal anatomy and depressed GCS, failure to saturate lung contusions, etc.? Or am I intubating because of abnormal anatomy, like the mandibular fracture that we saw? If I'm intubating for normal anatomy, I proceed for RSI, rapid sequence intubation. If I'm intubating for abnormal anatomy, I make the decision, is the patient stable or unstable? If they're unstable, it's going to be an ER intubation because they can't wait to go to the OR. It's a very similar decision-making process to an ED thoracotomy that needs to be done right then and there. Lola, as we would say in Quebec, right? It has to be done right then and there. 
and I would begin to intubate in the difficult anatomy scenario while having a dual setup, a second person ready to cut skin and a first person attempting the intubation. If the patient's stable, I will still have the dual setup, but I'm more likely to do it in the operating room. The same applies with RSI. I have one attempt at RSI before I do the dual setup. Even if the airway looks normal, if my junior resident, my senior resident, my fellow is having difficulty and they couldn't get it on the first try, as I'm doing the second attempt, I will already set up the second, the, the, the uh, crack set. And you know, that's just me being paranoid, you'll say, but I'll say at least I have a backup plan. When you're talking about choices of devices, there's like a whole bunch of stuff out there. Recently with paramedics, I've been using the air track when I'm on the field. But uh, for most hospital settings, I'd use direct laryngoscopy with a bougie because it has the highest chance of success. When I'm training somebody, the first couple of intubations, I let them use the video laryngoscope. Uh, we have one that's very similar to a direct laryngoscope, and they like using it, and it turns to help them out a lot. My next step up is fiber optic bronchoscopy, but I'll be honest with you, if the patient's bleeding, I don't tend to use it because the lens is so small, it gets covered up with the smallest drop of blood. And the McCoy, listen, I've been trained in using it, so I use it, but I have seen even fellows in anesthesia end up losing their space with it. Your failsafe will always be an LMA. So, you know, practice doing eye gels whenever you have hernias on board. So me and my anesthetist, we kind of have a silent agreement. Whenever I'm doing elective general surgery stuff that requires an LMA, like hernias, stuff like that, um, I'll end up putting the LMA. And every now and then when I have a goiter or a thyroid, um, I take out the tube and look at the vocal cords under bronchoscopic uh, guidance just because I, I want to retain that skill of dealing with this edematous airway situation, difficult airway situation. Moving on uh, to the stake part of this talk, uh, crack versus slash trach. So I keep hearing this a lot and, and you know people tell me slash trach or crack. Effectively the difference is about a centimeter, but it's a significant centimeter. So. A trach is done about a finger's breadth uh, above the suprasternal notch to two fingers breadth above it. It's done between the second and third uh, um, cartilages of the trachea. A crike is done between uh, the cricoid cartilage and the, um, the thyroid cartilage, the lower aspect of the thyroid cartilage. Now, you know, People keep making up reasons why the slash trach works and that doesn't, etc. Slash trachs are great if you can bring the patient to the operating room and you're an ENT surgeon and you have two people retracting for you. As you can see, to perform a slash trach adequately, first you have to be able to cut skin and get retractors in place, dissect down to the thyroid, mobilize the thyroid and take it off. This is not a skill that you will develop in the first two years of residency as an emergency physician. And your emergency physician is your front line when it comes to trauma. They're the people who are on the receiving end in most centers. Trauma surgeons are the second line in place. Trauma TTLs, whether they're surgeons, anesthetists, or etc., are also there. But none of the main specialties that deal with the trauma airways, so surgery, general surgery at least, um, uh, anesthesia, or emergency medicine, will be comfortable doing this in an operating room and your patients don't give you the space to do it there are certain patient populations where i will do this and i have done this i have actually done slash tricks with patients sitting up even i will do it but i will only do it in very specific populations and not trauma patients nor patients that arrive emergently uh, to the um, emergency room with a, a difficult airway that has failed in a difficult area that has failed, the most study seems to be the cricothyroidotomy. Longest series is 24 cases. They've all been successful. And the best method based on that series is the scalpel finger bougie technique. Or the scalpel finger technique that has been modified to scalpel finger bougie technique by Scott Weingard. And I use the same technique. Uh, technique's fairly simple. You palpate your area. You do a vertical incision, subsequently a transverse one through the cartilage, and you pop the tube in. I would thoroughly recommend you either watch my crack video or Ruben Strayer's, which is actually Ruben Strayer's, to be honest. I stole his and added a commentary to it with the nuances that I would have done differently. Um, but one thing that neither my video nor his addresses that happens fairly a lot in trauma 
is that your patients may have a difficult airway that you can't intubate because of a retropharyngeal hematoma secondary to a complex vertebral fracture. Now, when that happens, unless you get the airway through the uh, oropharynx, you are not going to get it in. Unless you get it through a, a, a standard laryngoscopic view, video assisted by Brobtic I don't care, you're not going to get yourself in a position to be able to do a crike uh, or a uh, slash uh, trach. And the reason why is this young gentleman, 72-year-old patient who was lucky enough to, uh, you know, ha survived and was um, graciously has given us the photos that I'm going to be showing you today, showed up at our trauma center here in Kuwait. He had a direct MVC injury to his neck. He was aphasic at the time, saturating 66% bradycardic, and there were four attempts to intubate him before the trauma team was activated. And because his history was unclear, people weren't sure what, what was going on. And in this case, you know, the option to intubate in the ER was already tried. To intubate in the OR would have taken way too long. The surgical airway in the ER and the OR seems to be the best option. And the surgical airway in the OR, he can't wait that long with a sat of 66%. He's just dissociating oxygen way too quickly. And so, you know, we ended up doing an emergent airway of the surgical nature in the uh, ER and subsequently taking him to the OR. And as you can see, he has a huge hematoma. And um, where do you think that tube is? So, it's very high up, yes. It's kind of not a crike or a slash trach. It's through a thyroid membrane and it's done by splitting the omohyoid. So this is something that I kind of had to do because of the size of the hematoma. In this CT scan, this is when he stabilized uh, after we had enough time and I'd evacuated the hematoma surgically. Um, I don't know if you can see the skin clips there, but I did a neck dissection, evacuated out the hematoma, ligated a bunch of vessels, and we elected not to dig into the trachea because there was a lot of hematoma across the thyroid too, and the neck wasn't stable enough for us to be able to extend him completely. And as you can see, it's a bit of an abnormal position, but you know the patient did have a fracture of his vertebra, so I couldn't extend him, and he had a massive hematoma blocking anywhere that the literature suggests I should put an airway. And so I had to improvise. I split the floor of the mouth and I palpated the hyoid bone and went directly under it uh, because I'd seen that area before and uh, tune in in about two episodes and you'll see when I saw it last. And so, you know, that's that was the only place that I could get, get it in, effectively right above the vocal cords. And, you know, it's very risky. It's a very risky area. We're not very familiar with it. But, you know, I would contend that this was a desaturating patient with a hematoma blocking off half of his neck. The next day in the ICU, he was a little bit lethargic. We got an MRI, and we found that he had a frontal lobe infarction. More on that later. But uh, he had suffered a blunt cerebrovascular injury as well, and it was a vertebral artery injury that you're seeing here. And uh, he had a bit of a subdural bleed, but it wasn't that big. And considering everything that he'd been through, you know, we did a CT angio to confirm it. He had a grade two vertebral artery dissection. We reported the case because as far as we knew in the literature, it wasn't uh, there before. Um, do not call this the Alzheimer's airway. Do not try this at home, kids. I don't think it should be a routine airway, but it is something to contend with. You know, that these patients, when they come in with blunt neck injuries and massive hematomas, a crike or a slash trach may not be your debate. There may not even be a debate. You may just have to get the airway in. And thankfully, the patient was discharged with no complications, so it's better to be lucky than good. But whenever somebody says a trach versus crike, I say, don't prepare to go. Prepare to be ready and just do it, right? Uh, this is from Scott Weingart, MCRIT. Uh, I would recommend that you go to the MCRIT slash uh, surgical airway uh, web link because um, I think it's amazing. Phenomenal resource. Um, I would say always be ready. So always find out where your kit is in your emergency room. Have one attempt at sticking the tube in. If you don't get it in, uh, do, do the dual setup. You'll thank me later. Uh, mark the area if you know that it's a difficult airway and plan to do the crike as if it's going to get done. And when your patient's that agonal, just go for it, right? Just go. Don't think twice. Uh, this is Saud Al-Zaid. Thank you for listening. And, um, you know, 
subscribe um, and you, thank you for the great response. A lot of the people who listen to the podcast were also on Surge Kuwait at the live session and I really appreciate it. I really appreciate the support and the feedback. Uh, tune in uh, next episode. We'll be doing some more neck trauma stuff. We'll be talking about blunt cerebrovascular injuries. And as always, your feedback is appreciated.